Good afternoon and TGIF. Woo -woo. I'm Chad Silver here with Stacey Spivey, Eric Chilton, and Tim Buckley. Now we are following two big stories today. First, Dr. Sharon Contreras leaving Guilford County Schools. But first, Governor Roy Cooper has declared a state of emergency ahead of this weekend's winter storm. Chief Meteorologist Tim Buckley tracking the winter weather heading our way and apparently by Sunday, right Tim? Yeah, that's right. We've been watching this all week. It's coming into clearer focus now and today is kind of the last day that's totally clear from any possible weather. Let me explain. I'll show you where that system is right now. It's making pretty good progress through the middle of the country. Here's Iowa. This is Minnesota. You can see they're dealing with a lot of snow out of this system and it's headed in an odd direction moving due south. It'll be in the deep south tomorrow and then it moves into the Carolinas on track for Sunday. Winter storm warnings have been issued areas south and west. We have winter storm watches. That's just a timing difference. We'll all have those upgraded going into the storm. Let me walk you through it. One thing I want to mention so you're not caught off guard. It is possible tomorrow afternoon. That's Saturday afternoon. There could be a few snow showers between 2 and 6 p.m. A light coating could be possible. I don't think most of us will see it, but it might make a slick spot. Here's when the storm really starts. Between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. on Sunday, we see snow moving in from the south. But look how quickly it gets replaced by snow with sleet. We're seeing that move up toward I-40 by noon, which means your snowfall is done at that point, areas south of Greensboro. Throughout the rest of the day, we see that sleet turning over to freezing rain. Meanwhile, you're still lucky enough to have all snow in the mountains and foothills. So it's complicated. It depends on where you are. And because of the more snow amounts out west, that's where we have our highest totals. You'll get snow longer, so the mountains could get six to 10 inches, about four to six from Stokes to Yadkin, parts of northern Rockingham. Most of the triad north of I-85 should plan on between a sloppy two to four inches of snow combined with sleet. Remember, it gets compacted down, so it's not as tall. Farther south and east, about one to two inches or so, give or take. Those areas, though, have a better risk of freezing rain, and that's where we have that more moderate risk of power outages, even a higher risk of power outages in my mind as you go down toward Montgomery County, Chatham and more. Bottom line, all of us are going to have bad travel, especially all day Sunday, and that could linger into next week. We have to be prepared for scattered power outages as well. Tim, thank you. With today's forecast, you wouldn't know we're expecting this kind of weather come Sunday. The highs are around 50. Skies are clear, but it's breezy. Yeah, Triad Road teams are finalizing their plans and preps as we inch closer to the weekend. WFM News 2's Jenna Krasina is at the city of Greensboro's staging area this afternoon. Jenna, sounds like today's the day to get things started. Yeah, Chad, the city of Greensboro is actually gearing up and starting to get ready to go out and pre-treat some roads tonight. You can see their plow trucks are lined up and also ready to go for the weekend. Now they do have a salt barn here and inside of the salt barn, there is enough salt to last them for four large winter events. So no shortage of supplies here. This morning, NCDOT went out around Guilford County, hitting those primary roads and highways. You may have noticed those big sprayer trucks along the interstates today. One truck I followed behind had 5,000 gallons worth of treatment to spray. It's going to be all hands on deck for their crews this weekend. Go back and finish filling the trucks up and uh, put some pliers and spreaders on. Everything on this truck got to come off and we're going to put a spreader on it and put a plow on it. We are expecting significant accumulation of ice on the roadway. That's not the time to be traveling. So try to work your travel around that. Uh, get get to your destination before it starts or wait until after it ends. Uh, there will be some black ice, particularly in the mornings after the event, so please be aware of that. Um, and just, if you do have to travel, take your time um, and leave plenty of time to get to your destination. Don't get in a hurry. Like DOT mentioned, if you do have to go out this weekend, definitely be careful and take your time on the roads. And if you do see crews out there, be mindful of them as well. Jenna, thank you. NC Department of Transportation continues with their preparations despite a staffing shortage. Crews loaded up trucks today with brine and salt in Forsyth County. DOT officials say they're dealing with the same staffing issues as other companies due to COVID and seasonal illnesses. John Rhine with Division 9 explains how crews will handle road conditions once a storm makes it to the triad. 
Obviously, we let a little snow build up on the roadways before we start plowing operations, half inch, inch, something like that. Uh, and then we will start repetitively plowing and applying salt, letting the salt work in and melt, plow again until snow stops. Division 9 is operating at 70% staffing, and state DOT officials say they will have con contractors helping around the state as needed. If you do need to be out on the roads during the storm, an emergency kit is crucial. These are some of the things you should consider putting in a kit. You can easily leave these things in your car throughout the winter if you've got extras. Feel free to take a picture of your screen so you have it, or we'll also put this list of suggested supplies in a winter weather story on WFMYNews2.com. Well, National Guard troops will deploy to Surrey County before this winter storm. Surrey County Emergency Management said they're expecting service members to arrive by tomorrow and they'll stay into next week to help with storm response. Officials will learn more this afternoon about how many soldiers they're expecting there. Utility crews are getting ahead, making sure they're prepared to address power outages as fast as possible when and if they, are, they happen. Electric Utilities for the city of High Point has called on crews in Florida for backup. There are about a dozen High Point teams setting up. As other crews across the triad prepare, they all have one message for everyone. Be patient. There's a lot of work involved in this that, that people you know, that, that aren't in this business have no idea. And, you know, a lot of them think to themselves, it's like a light switch in their house. When they switch it on, it everything just comes back on. But with us, you know, we, we're dealing with, you know, adverse conditions, you know, the snow, the sleet, rain, and, you know, we got lines down, tangled up all all over it. it, it all that's got to be sorted out. It, it's, a, it's a lot that goes into it that people have no idea. Teams say they expect to see the most outages during the peak of the storm. If winds reach high speeds, employees may be restricted from going in buckets to repair lines, but officials don't foresee winds being an issue. Another big story that we are on top of today, Guilford County School Superintendent Dr. Sharon Contreras is leaving. Contreras is taking on a new role as CEO of the Innovation Project, a nonprofit group of state school district superintendents and their teams. WFY News 2's Avery Powell talked to her today. Avery, what did Dr. Contreras have to say about her decision? Dr. Sharon Contreras says she's thankful to have a quote second dream job come up for her as the new CEO of the Innovation Project. Contreras started as the Guilford County School Superintendent in 2016 and will finish out the academic school year. Contreras said the decision to leave was brought on by this opportunity with the Innovation Project, project a nonprofit organization based in Raleigh that brings together superintendents across the state to improve public education. She said her 10 plus years of experience as a superintendent will help her guide and work with new superintendents who face never before seen issues. The pandemic has made the job very complex and I think that the community has to come together to solve some of the problems created by the pandemic instead of uh, simply looking at school districts and saying this is a school district problem. I think that makes it much more difficult to keep educators in positions. Dr. Contreras said she is most proud of the work the Guilford County Board of Education did to get the $300 million bond vote, but she regrets that all students in the district aren't performing the best they can and don't have the same opportunities to move upward in society. Board of, Board of Education leaders say they still need to meet all together to start discussing next steps for selecting a new superintendent.
Not many have been spared when it comes to staffing shortages, including animal services and shelters. This only adds to the stress as they're seeing an influx of strays and surrenders. Right now, Guilford County Animal Services is almost full and you're taking a look at some of the video of the dogs and cats there at the shelter. Director Jorge Ortega says as the Omicron variant rapidly spreads, many workers and volunteers are calling out either due to sickness or being exposed to COVID. They were already experiencing a shortage of veterinarian staff. Ortega says while they're not facing a critical need right now, any day that could change. There's a lot of uncertainty, like what happens tomorrow. So we're really operating day by day and just evaluating what our animal population is and then what our staff population is and seeing to make sure that we can provide adequate service. Forsyth Humane Society is also dealing with a major staffing issue on top of a surge in strays and surrenders. Director Mark Neff tells me at least six employees are out right now because of COVID, and this is the worst it has been for staffing since the beginning of the pandemic. And this is a look at all the strays that they have right now. I asked him why he thinks there are so many abandoned dogs at the time. He thinks it's a combination of economic challenges and families facing medical issues. So what can we do to help or maybe you do to help? Well, right now Guilford County Animal Services says make sure that your dog has a collar with tags or also a microchip and so if they're lost the owners can quickly be found. Now in Forsyth County they say that they're grateful for their robust foster program but they also want to encourage people to continue fostering if they are able. So really just a critical shortage right now um, across the board with all these shelters that I've been talking to and of course you know if they're facing those shortages then they're having to do multiple jobs and then especially with this winter weather coming up you wonder okay well are the dogs going to be okay are the cats going to be okay so if you can foster please try to do that that's exactly the first thing i thought of was there are, people are abandoning dogs because they can't afford it mm -hmm. right now or cats as well um and then that storm coming that's the first thing i thought of that we got to get out there i think maybe at this point if you see a cat or a dog out wandering around probably the best thing to do is try to help out you know um, it, I'm so grateful that they now have the shelter too, to be the bigger shelter to be able to take That's in true. more pets. But I suppose if you don't have the staff to take care of, I mean, what's the point of the, the bigger shelter? Mm -hmm. It's a shame um, that they're dealing with this, especially knowing that the, this was the weather. Did yeah. you give any indication of, it, is it looking like it might pick up or is it looking like it's worse or are they just kind of just waiting to see at this point? He said day by day basis wow. right now because he's like, you never know. I mean, one employee could test positive, another one could be exposed, and that's the issue right now. They just they don't know what's going to happen, so they just have to be careful. Yeah, it's we all bad. have to chip in, do what we can. And yeah. I quickly though want to mention um, Betty White. Her birthday is coming up. Of course, it would have been her 100th, and there is the Betty White Challenge. I'm going to talk more about that on Monday, but because of that, Guilford County Animal Services, they're having $17 adoptions. So now is the time to adopt if you want a cat That's or dog. Very good. Yeah. That was her birthday, the 17th of January. We'll be right back.
Well, it seems like we've been talking about it for, I don't know, like 12 days. It's been a couple at least that we're watching and watching and waiting for this storm to get here. It is coming together right now. I'll show you the different pieces that have to be in place before you get winter weather here in the Carolinas. The first is that cold air. We always talk about it being a building block and necessity before anything can happen. And we really have it sliding in tomorrow. Today is by far the warmest that it's going to be over the next week of weather. Right now we're in the 50s. Tomorrow will be in the 30s all day. Brief couple snow showers possible in the afternoon. But look at what our storm does. It goes from way up in Iowa all the way down into Alabama and Mississippi. They don't get snow from this, not really. They're mostly getting rain. But once it comes into our cold air, it really becomes potent. You see that snow on the backside and the mix, that dreaded mixing with ice. That's kind of what we're dealing with. So while we could see those scattered snow showers tomorrow afternoon, the main event begins Sunday morning between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. You see it's snow to start, then it transitions a bit from south to north into sleet. Sleet are those ice pellets that fall from the sky and just kind of accumulate on the ground. The freezing rain is what coats things and creates power outages, and that's what we could see by the late afternoon, mostly in this general area here. It could finish off with some scattered snow showers, but they're usually not that impressive on the backside. Highest snow totals will be areas where it snows the longest. That's in the mountains and foothills, least over to the south and east as an average most of the triad between two and four inches, which is a heavy dense snow because of the sleet that's mixed in there. Lower power outages north and west, higher power outages south and east. That's because of the ice accumulating and weighing down trees and power lines. All of us are going to have bad travel. The snow, yeah, that's bad too, but the ice is really a bigger concern for many of us because of what it can do to our impacts. Bottom line, gotta be ready for those power outages just in case and be ready for those roads not just to be bad for a day or two but for several days because we're going to stay cold honestly all of next week cold mornings ahead all right so there is an incredible science initiative it's happening at salem academy in winston-salem the high school students are literally learning how to edit genes they're using a resource kit that's called crispr in a box I spoke with Amanda Hughes with the Christiana Cares Gene Editing Institute about this program, and she says it's really all about what they refer to as CRISPR. What CRISPR does, CRISPR allows us to pinpoint a certain location within DNA so that when the CRISPR cuts, we can then modify it. So we kind of refer to it as a Word document, or it's very similar to a Word document where you can cut, change, and paste in a Word document. You can also do the same with CRISPR gene editing. Um, and CRISPR, we like to sometimes refer to when we're talking to our students as a pair of molecular scissors because CRISPR really just cuts the DNA and then we can go in and modify it. This is a huge opportunity for high school age kids to really do hands-on experiments with gene editing. Hughes says she hopes it will lead to these students maybe going into the field. I think certainly CRISPR technology is going to pave the way um, for the way that we find cures for diseases like cancer and sickle cell anemia. It's um, an underdeveloped field, so it's new and it's upcoming, which is why we really want to teach the students this amazing technology through this educational kit, um, because we're essentially training the next generation of future scientists and leaders, and hopefully they'll consider a career in gene editing. And in the next half hour, we'll talk to the students about what they thought about this project. It's really cool that they get this opportunity. There's only a handful of educational institutions in the country that are doing this. And Salem Academy, for those of you that don't remember, just recently decided it would be a STEM Academy for girls. So it's 9 through 12, mostly girls, and uh, they're learning some great STEM stuff here. I mean, it's fabulous. I thought about pretending like I knew what any of that was about. <laughs> right. But I really, I, I'm kind of getting flashbacks to watching the Teen Jeopardy tournament where I don't know any of the answers. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, it's, it's impressive impressive what kids are learning these days. Oh yeah, I mean, the whole time of the story you were talking about it, I was thinking about that uh, genetically modified pig heart that was transplanted yes. to a, a, a man uh, earlier this week. And I just kept thinking, okay, if we're doing that now and these kids are learning this at this age, what are they gonna be able to do when they're adults? They were saying, the instructor was telling me that some of what they do with cancer research now and gene editing, and they're using the actually the same thing that the Salem Academy girls got a chance to experience is that they can go in, look at your genetic makeup, and maybe figure out whether you are going to get cancer or not. And then it would be amazing if they could go in and change that gene or remove that part that, I mean, that's, to make that, it, that's huge. Oh could you imagine? No, that'd be the biggest thing mm. ever. Change the world. Very cool. We'll have more on this coming up in a bit. Stay there.
The first two weeks of 2022 have been anything but easy. A winter storm with another one on the way, another COVID surge and skyrocketing inflation are all sources of stress. That's why it's important to reset and recharge every so often and focus on the good. WFMI News 2's Megan Malaris makes it her mission each week to find the blessings bringing joy to you. So I know you're busy multitasking, preparing for the evening and a weekend winter storm, but if you can use just the next couple of minutes for some reflection, it'll do your mind a world of good. I asked you on my Facebook page, Megan Malaris News, to tell me something good, big or small, that happened in your life recently. Shannon got married three weeks ago. Tracy and her husband are celebrating their 31st wedding anniversary. Renee turned 50 on January 2nd. She is joyful. Crystal got engaged and is so excited to get married. Mamie paid off her car a year early and her husband paid off his too. Melanie had storm damage to her barn. Some church members helped her clear debris and miraculously she found no damage to the roof. Joy scheduled cataract surgery and is looking forward to seeing better soon. Sherry is pursuing a possible new job. Scott got a negative COVID test, as did Gerald. Kelly's family has remained healthy. Bobby met WFMI News 2 meteorologist Ed Matthews recently and enjoyed sitting down for a chat. And April became a grandmother. Cute so sweet. picture there. Yes. I know, I love that. Something good, we go down the line. Okay, so uh, yesterday I booked a flight to go celebrate my best friend from college's 40th birthday Woo! on the beach in Florida. So I'm in oh. my mind, I'm just gonna live there until April. It's not until <laughs> April. Yeah, <laughs> you probably should think that this Sunday for right, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. For me, it was uh, my son Alex, second oldest, uh, sent me a picture of a letter he got in the mail the other day. He made the dean's list freshman year, first That's semester. Wow. Oh, congrats really. to him. That's Great. something his dad never did, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of my best friends, she had her baby boy. This is her second and uh, he's healthy and they're happy and at home. And um, Eloise is now a big sister and she is already, you know, doing the best job ever at being that. Being a big sister yeah. is what she's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Very nice. All right, you let us know what's happening good to you on Facebook. We'll be back. Wrong pocket. Figure it out. What's up, friends? That's what it felt like. <laughs> What's your favorite fish? <laughs> your mom? Gosh, what? <laughs> Jalen, my check. My check. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now it should be on still, yeah. She was saying she can hear you on the stream, so watch your mouth. Oh, there we go. I can't hear you now. Ice cold milk and an Oreo cookie, they forever go together like a quest combination. That's a weird sound. Is that me or is that something else? Really? Hmm, okay. Well, I'm coming out of my office, so we'll see if it continues on. Hello, 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 ice cold milk and an Oreo cookie. And hello, 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 hello. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay.
Hey everyone, happy Friday. I'm Stacy Spivey with Eric Chilton and Chad Silver, and we're on top of two very big stories today. Guilford County School Superintendent Dr. Sharon Contreras is leaving her position as superintendent. And the other story we are following, bracing for a winter storm headed our way this weekend. Yeah, Tim's been tracking this all week for us. Forecast low, little by little coming into line, Tim. Yeah, you know how it goes, Eric. We kind of get a little bit more detail every day and kind of zeroing in on a final answer here as we get into that Sunday time frame. Here's the storm. It's still really far, but it's much closer than it was. Take a look. You can see it very clearly. Oh, hold on a second. There we go. You can see snow and rain in the middle of the country. This is Iowa. This is Minnesota. They're getting our winter blast at the moment on the south. It's just rain and just like us, they kind of have these precipitation differences to deal with. Bottom line, we're all in line for winter weather come Sunday. No one watching this is going to have zero winter weather, but it will vary a lot from place to place, which is why we have those winter storm watches in warnings for tomorrow. You're mostly OK throughout the day, but there could be a little burst of a couple snow showers Saturday afternoon that might put down a quick accumulation in some spots. Here's how it begins 5 AM to 9 AM. That's when the snow starts. It shouldn't be really bad before that. It's mostly dry until that morning time frame, and then we quickly see a changeover by the middle of the day in the afternoon to sleep. Sleet is what kind of ruins your snow accumulation a little bit, then freezing rain and then a little bit of snow to end things out. It's really an all day Sunday event and the totals will vary greatly. That's what we deal with here in North Carolina from six to 10 inches up in the mountains and foothills to as little as one inch or less down in the coastal plain. We're in the middle in the triad. Most of us should plan on a very heavy two to four inches because of the sleet. It makes it hard to move around four to six farther north and west, one to two farther south and east. The icing risk is greater more south and more East. So power outages would be a bigger concern for me in Randolph, Montgomery, Chatham, more, but even anywhere from Greensboro to Burlington to Caswell, pay attention. You could have scattered power outages as well. Bottom line, kind of plan to be stuck inside all day Sunday and perhaps a little longer than that. The travel on the roads is going to be really tough to do. There's your planner for tomorrow. Still dry through the middle of the day, maybe a quick snow shower or two in the afternoon. And next week, it's going to stay cold all week long, which keeps that sleet on the roadways a while. If you've been to any kind of store in the last few days, you probably run into more people than normal as everyone grabs last minute supplies. One of our team members went to his local store and saw there was no bread. Hardware stores have also been busy and say they expect today to be their busiest. WFMY News 2's Jalen Gilkey spent the day out and about and checking out store inventories. Jalen, what did you see out there today besides, I'm sure, chaos? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was pretty close to chaos, Stacey. I saw a lot of shoppers out and about. They grabbed ice melt, propane, and more. I talked to Blake Miller with Cantor Power Systems. He told me what you need to know if you decided to pick up a new generator. A generator is one of those things you don't think about until you need it. So if you bought one for the first time this week, there's a few things you need to know. Uh, number one is these generators run on usually propane, liquid propane or uh, natural gas. For liquid propane, that is something that you're going to have a tank on your home and you're really going to want to make sure that's topped off before any event or that's going to limit the amount of hours your generator can run. The next step seems obvious, but Blake told me it's the biggest problem people run into when they're trying to use their generator. The battery that is actually going to crank the generator in the event of an outage. You're going to want to make sure you manually run your generator to ensure that your battery is charged up and can actually get your generator started in the event of an outage. And last but not least, be your oil, making sure that you have enough in the generator and when it runs for more than a few days, keeping some on hand. One more safety tip we want to make sure you understand. You did it yourself. Uh, you're probably going to want to make sure carbon monoxide detectors are on hand, and especially if your generator's running for multiple days that uh, you're not having that enter the home. According to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, 70 people a year are affected by carbon monoxide poisoning from a generator, and thousands more are injured. So get help from a professional if you can. All right, what we all fear is the power going out, right? You just heard him talking about the whole generator thing. Well, it's not only the cold factor, right? But what about all my food in my freezer or my fridge? You start worrying about it, don't you? Yeah, you have to remind the kids too. keep the door closed. Don't be looking around for <laughs> yeah. things. 
See, the good part of this time of year, the silver lining, because it's cold, your freezer and the fridge will stay colder longer than, you know, if the power goes out in the summer. Yeah, that's a Wisconsin boy for you right there. <laughs> yeah. All right, so true. So don't forget this, folks. If the power goes out, the good news is you have snow or freezing temperatures outside. If you're worried about certain things, you can stick them outside. You'll have a built in refrigerator or freezer. That's right. The milk and the meat and the veggies, whatever you got. Now, I'm curious, friends, have any of you ever done that before? Use the outside to your advantage. We did it this year at Thanksgiving because okay. it was, we had so many people. We didn't have enough room in the fridge, so we used the back porch. Um, so my example, when I was in college in Michigan and the snow would come up past our windows in the dorms, we would just throw stuff in the ice <laughs> outside the windows. So it was like an extra fridge. Okay. All right. Well, now I know that we all stocked up, right? And here we make a joke about milk and bread in North Carolina, but let me show you what my plan is because man and woman does not m live on bread and milk alone. I've got a gas top flat grill and I bought all these things that I can grill from pancakes to eggs, grilled cheese, hamburgers, don't forget the veggies. I got some cauliflower rice in there and some stir fry. I have a few things too that you can't make on the griddle, but then you can heat up on the griddle. So I'll make them and freeze them on Saturday just in case those happen to be my tricks. You got one? Um, I do have a trick. It's called Uber Eats. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. But I don't if, know if they're going to be doing it. But what if your driver like goes off the road, yeah. God forbid, but if what if that happens? If it's Uber Sleets, then Uber. you're in trouble there on Sunday. <laughs> Well, then I'll try DoorDash. <laughs> Got it. Of course, if you can get out and get a hot meal, all the better. But if you can, it's good to have just more than milk and bread, don't you think? You had to buy more than milk and bread, didn't you? Okay. All right. So remember, folks, it is the time to charge up your cell phones, your power banks, your devices. Check the cabinet for your prescription drugs. If you take one on a daily basis and you're close to a refill, you need to go out and get that done just in case. Gas up, and that means your vehicles, but it also means your generator, and it also means your grill fuel, whether that's gas or whether charcoal, whatever you got. And then gather up your batteries, your flashlights, and candles now just so you know that you have them. Tanya, thanks for all the great advice. Now our other top story today. GCS Superintendent Dr. Sharon Contreras announced she is leaving her role as superintendent. Dr. Contreras is taking on a new role as the CEO of the Innovation Project, a nonprofit group of state school district superintendents and their teams. In a press conference earlier this afternoon, Dr. Contreras said she's going to miss the children of Guilford County Schools and she's proud of the work the district has done for students. She explained since starting her position in 2016, a superintendent's job in general has grown more complicated. I think it's a much more difficult job than it's ever been. I think that's true for all of our staff, for uh, teachers, principals, bus drivers. Uh, I think it's very complicated, uh, very complex. The pandemic has made the job very complex, and I think that the community has to come together to solve some of the problems created by the pandemic instead of uh, simply looking at school districts and saying this is a school district problem. I think that makes it much more difficult to keep educators in positions. Dr. Contreras will stay in her role as superintendent until August. The district has not made any mention of a plan for finding her replacement, but of course we'll keep you updated. Rockingham County Schools is also in the process of finding a new superintendent. They sent parents a survey for input on that search. This means longtime superintendent Dr. Rodney Shotwell will not return. You might remember the district tried to fire him in 2020. The board voted to get rid of him even though his contract wasn't up. Many parents and teachers opposed the move. Shortly after, Shotwell sued. After deliberation in court, a judge ruled Shotwell could keep his job. His contract runs through this June. The district's hope to announce his replacement by May. Well, Guilford County's mask mandate is in effect once again after the Board of Health voted last night to reinstate the mandate. This means you'll need to wear your mask in any indoor setting regardless of vaccination status. This mandate now includes Greensboro and High Point. Chairman Skip Alston said those who don't follow the masking rules will face fines. The mandate will remain in effect through February 27th. That is unless the board makes any changes between now and then.
We've also just learned that Forsyth County Board of Health has called a special meeting. This is for next week. Leaders will discuss the possibility of a countywide mask mandate. That meeting, by the way, is on the 19th, which is Wednesday. We'll bring you updates as we get more information. Our state broke two more records in coronavirus data today. The state health department says it learned of more than 35,000 new cases in the past 24 hours. It's 1,500 more than the record we set just yesterday. Today's number also crossed us over the 2 million mark for COVID cases in our state. Hospitalizations also hit a new record today for the third day in a row. There are more than 4,300 North Carolinians in the hospital with coronavirus. Today's number is 900 more than the number that we saw one week ago. Let's get to your four to five roundup. If you're out shopping for last minute supplies and you shop at Harris Teeter, don't expect to get any of your Evix specials this weekend. The store announced specials will not be offered to customers due to supply chain issues. Every Friday, Harris Teeter Evic members receive an email with the special sales that fit their shopping habits. This announcement follows the company's most recent decision to close stores early starting this week. Harris Teeter said it hopes to bring back Evic deals next week. The saga continues. Novak Djokovic faces deportation once again after the Australian government revoked his visa for a second time. Australia's immigration minister used his authority to cancel the tennis star's visa on the grounds of public interest. This comes just three days before the Australia Open begins. Djokovic has been on Australia's radar after complications with his apparent exemption from getting the COVID vaccine. Now, a judge reinstated the player's visa, and we later learned Djokovic had made public appearances last month despite testing positive for the virus. Deportation from Australia usually leads to a three-year ban on returning to their country. Jeopardy icon Amy Schneider has won her 32nd straight game and is now tied for third place for the number of consecutive games won. Schneider took home the win with more than $32,000. She got a big push after finding and correctly answering all three daily double questions. Since her first game on November 17th, she has won over a million dollars and is the highest earning female contestant in Jeopardy history. Prince Andrew has been stripped of all his royal patronage, patronages and military affiliations with the Queen's approval. The announcement came a day after a U.S. District Judge rejected Andrew's motion to dismiss a lawsuit brought by his accuser claiming he sexually abused her when she was 17. All of his formal roles have been handed back to Queen Elizabeth and will be redistributed to other members of the royal family. He also will no longer be using His Royal Highness in any official capacities. His lawyers argue, argue the lawsuit should be thrown out because of a 2009 deal the victim, Virginia Gouffier, signed with convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. The judge argues the 2009 deal cannot benefit Andrew. We'll be right back.
Earlier in the show, I told you about the students at Salem Academy and how they're getting an unbelievable science experience these days. The kits they're using for this experience are called CRISPR in a box. CRISPR is literally a way to edit genes. Salem Academy teamed up with the Christiana Cares Gene Editing Institute to give them hands-on experience at actual gene editing. The students uh, worked in a lab using resource kits. I spoke with students Ann Riley Harmon and Lola Larson who said this was an invaluable experience. Well, really, I think having the opportunity to work with this sort of gene editing technology as a high school freshman to me is really exciting. And also getting to be able to be a part of experiment that's going to better the world of gene editing and the medical world in the future is really exciting. It was very nice because we all had someone to help us and it was very neat and organized, the steps, and they show you and tell you everything that you need to do. And um, we're always there to help. So the students said they realize that these types of opportunities don't come along every day and this does affect their futures. I've always been interested in um, STEM and science and math and I hope to go into the medical field in my future. Um, I want to be a neurosurgeon right now but I know that's going to change. Yes, I also would love to be in the medical field um, or like in STEM and I think doing this experience and opportunity um, or having this experience has what um, made this go further and made me want to do it more. I mean, it's incredible that you're, so um, Ann Riley is a sophomore, Lola's a freshman, I think I have that right. Um, but at 15, 16 years old, you're learning how to edit genes. <laughs> it's that incredible. just doesn't happen very often. And I don't know much about Salem Academy. I mean, is this something that they're known for, or are they just trying to kind of trailblaze here? Yeah, this is their, since they've become a STEM Academy for girls, this is their, their first really big initiative. And Salem Academy, Academy and Salem College kind of work together, too, to help each other out. So it's a program that literally only a handful, like, don't quote me, but I think they said only six or seven schools in the country are doing this right now. But this CRISPR in a box idea, is what they want to spread out across the country to kids everywhere. Hmm. I love this. this. This sounds like something that we'll be doing a mo on the go about years yes. to come. You know, these girls are going to grow up and be STEM leaders in our society. And I think this is wonderful. We need more girls in science it's and true. math and all that kind of stuff I because all I can't this. do it. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's a good idea. We should actually tell Monique about that. I think, mm -hmm. we, why wait? We could do the story now about exactly it. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's go. We'll just head out there and go <laughs> do it right on the now. go. <laughs> Nothing's stopping us. Sorry, we'll take a break. We'll see you in a bit. Is that for the winner?
All right, welcome back everybody. We are watching our winter weather, of course, for the weekend, but a Friday that is really enjoyable. Enjoy this. If you're not a fan of snow, ice, cold, all of that, just enjoy this because it's going to be a long while before we get this again. We're in the 50s and nothing bad is happening outside whatsoever. Cold air is on the way. It's moving down the East Coast overnight tonight and really into tomorrow. We're going to be in the thick of it. Cold weather in the 30s is likely pretty much all day and clouds will be thickening up too. One thing you might find is a scattered snow shower for Saturday afternoon, but here's the winter storm it starts to approach in Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas and Tennessee Saturday afternoon. For us, it really is slowing down a little bit, so it's not until about 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. on Sunday when we would start to see some of that snow. Then it switches over to that mix, which we don't like. That's the mix of sleet and eventually some freezing rain which could lead to some power outage problems. There's Futurecast early Sunday morning. Watch the midday. You see that layer of sleet moving in, changing to freezing rain by afternoon. And then I think that snow is overdone on the backside. We will have inches on the ground, about six to 10 in the north and west, only one to two south and east. It really depends on where you live because it matters how much ice you get and how much mixing. Your higher freezing rain is south and east, and that's where we could have worse power outage problems. It stays cold all next week. That means the roads in your neighborhood could be bad for a while. Well, some of us may be stuck, we think, right, in our homes on Sunday, maybe early next week, too. So I asked you on Facebook, tell me what your go-to activity is to beat cabin fever. Great comments here. Gene says all the WFMI viewers are coming to Chilton's house over <laughs> overnight. See you there. Uh, Christopher says NFL playoffs snow me in and let me watch football all day. That is a good idea. Tina says watching movies and if the power goes uh, out, then the old standby reading books. Tracy says it depends on whether or not we have electricity. Lights and Wi-Fi, it's Netflix and video games. No lights, it's cards and board games. Angie Harper says binging Ozark season three because season four comes out next week. What? I am with you on that. Oh. Yes. I, I didn't you know that. You just found that out? Oh, yes. yes. I cannot wait. Good news. And my favorite comment, Scott, I'll just let the beer decide. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, that's great. Yes, it is out next week and I wow. can't wait. Oh, okay. I, I digress. Right. Okay. Perfect timing for it too, right? Yes. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of with the camp on stay home, watch Netflix, Hulu, and just do nothing. Yeah, I'm going to binge the season, second season of Cheer this weekend, of course. Mm. I mean, what else would you expect? Of course, you? of course. But I'm, the only reason why, the only reason why I'm hoping that it does snow a lot is because it'll be Baylor, my daughter's first snow, and oh, I want her right. to experience that. and get out there and you know I'm and sure she'll eat it. Snow. Yes, yeah. you will. Right. It. Yeah. I mean I, I still eat it. So right. I mean I, <laughs> same. Yeah, just introduce it to her, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, I'm kind of in the mindset of the be inside watch NFL as much as I can because the games coming up this weekend to me are going to be great games. Like this is when the best are playing the best, right? So mm -hmm. Well, fun. I mean the Packers aren't playing this weekend. They've, well. they've got the bye, so it's not the best versus <laughs> Okay, the best, stop. Next weekend. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that your uh, prediction for the you think it's Packers? I know your heart is there, but is, does your head say that too? I don't think they're going to make it to the Super Bowl. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of conflict there with Aaron and the... Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. But we are going to make it to break. We can do that. Do you like that? Let's do that right Our now. Our producer said, go to break. <laughs> See you on Sunday. You can relax. Yes, I agree. Take it easy. I can't wait to see your get up. Hey, Me? my check one, two, three, four, five, six. Check, check, check. Mic check. Mike, three, check. Three. <clears throat> hey, hello. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hi there, Callie. Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas. Hello, friend. Where do you say I'm supposed to be for this head nod? At the touch. Okay. Head. Oh. Mike tag one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Mike. Hey, Mike check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
Dr. Contreras will be the new CEO of the Innovation Project. Well, it's time for my two cents. And what is everyone thinking about and talking about right now? Hmm, would it be a winter storm? Yeah, I think it is. So I looked online, did a little research, some psychological effects and some unusual things about cold weather and snow and how it affects us. So this was really cool. Researchers say that the brain's level of activity is traditionally lowest in the wintertime. However, they say its performance and its reactions to things are just as strong as it would be in spring or fall or summer. Interesting, they say we kind of go into an efficiency mode. So in other words, uh, its performance is the same, but it uses less resources to achieve the same outcome. How about that? We're more efficient, our brain at least, in the winter. Now, this was unusual. I read a study it was from 2014 that said that women tend to wear more pink and red when the weather is cold. Didn't really give a whole lot of explanation there, but interesting to note. And then how about this, and I believe this, snow has a calming effect, right? Um, it, it reduces noise all across the air. You know what, that, that, that blanket of snow and everything's so quiet, it just kind of deadens or dampens the sound. And then it evokes nostalgia, it makes us all think when we were kids and snowball fights and snow forts and fun like that. Nostalgia is always a calming effect as well. In fact, I have a quote from an author that I thought was really cool. Um, their name is Novala Takimoto, and they said, Snow falling soundlessly in the middle of the night will always fill my heart with sweet clarity. <sighs> so, don't panic about Sunday. Have some sweet clarity, people. That's what we're supposed to do. And that's just my two cents. And that's your 4 to 5. WFMY News 2 at 5 starts now.